Well, I want to thank everyone out there in, uh, on their phones, on their computers, for checking out my YouTube channel. Uh, about four years ago, I put my first YouTube channel out into the internet, and the response was, was really strong, and so that made me want to want to share more of my information with the public. And over the last four years, we've had about 1.3 million views. That's been a lot of fun, and it's really been encouraging for us because it shows there's a lot of, a lot of need out there for uh, the information that we're sharing. So I just wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy life to check out our channel. What I have in my hand is the next step in our evolution as a system of trying to communicate ideas to you. There's a book that we've written. It's called Your Genius Body. And really what it is, it's a summary of all the work that we've put into our practice, put into functional medicine over the last about nine years. So if you like the ideas you see on today's video or some of the other videos on our channel, I would highly encourage you to get your hands on this book. This book is really a summary um, and a great reference for all the ideas that we use to help our patients as we share in these videos. So you can get this if you go to www.beyondmthfr.com and you'll have an option there to purchase the book either in paperback which uh, is always a little easier on the eyes or you can also download the digital version for your Kindles and iPads. So I hope you enjoy this coming video here and then please stay tuned for the end. We'll have a special message for you at the end of the video as well. Dopamine caught my attention because perhaps my own health journey I have run into the idea that uh, one reason that I was uh, you know, hypoglycemic and depressed and had some of my own mental health issues was that I didn't have correct dopamine levels. And that, that always stuck in my brain um, as I went through my doctoral program and learned more about human health and physiology. And as I continued to study and, and go to more seminars and get exposed to more ideas, we were able to incorporate this idea of dopamine into a very basic, it's an elegantly simple model. And the model is basically that there are people out here in our society, and really, I would, I would say it in the words that every single person would fall into one, or, one of these categories. We have a tendency to either have low dopamine when we're stressed out, or high dopamine. And there's reasons why that this up and down uh, level of dopamine occurs. And so when you understand that people have a, there's genetics that are involved, there's gut issues that are involved, there's nutrition that's involved, um, but really what happens is when we're under stress, different people go in different directions, but there's really, in my opinion, two directions. You either have high dopamine or low. And once you understand that, then you begin to understand how you can start to help these individuals live a more happy life, a more fulfilling life, but more, uh, they can finally sleep, they can finally, uh, take on a new career or take on a project in their life that might stress them out. Um, and if we can help balance dopamine, then they can, there's really, it helps them become a more optimal human being. And that's why it's optimizing mental health, but really if you, if you optimize your brain, you optimize pretty much everything else. As I, as I like to say in a lot of my videos, um, and this is maybe how I like to approach problems, I like to look as big a picture as possible. And I've always been inspired by people who, who, instead of getting caught in the details, they always are able to like pull themselves up. And instead of just getting obsessed with this tree over here, they keep their eye on the forest at the same time. They can kind of change levels. So we're going to start big, and then we're going to get lower and deeper, and then, and then kind of end big again. But if I just threw details out, it's, it's not as effective as, as if we look at the, the big picture first. So the moral of the story is more and more people in our society are being diagnosed with depression. Depression is a label that meets certain criteria that people are trained to, you know, recognize. Uh, but especially young people, there's a growing number of people out there in our country and our society that have depression that aren't getting treated. And I would argue even that the treatments aren't that effective, at least from a medical standard mental health point of view. This is another um, data point that came across my radar just a few weeks ago. This was published um, on NBC News' website, and the data they pulled was from the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So you, you wonder how much data these big insurance companies have, Kaiser Permanente, Blue Cross. They probably have an enormous amount of data, maybe even more than PhDs doing research um, you know, at an Ivy League school. You'd think, you'd think they would just have so much data on, on the well-being or the, the illness patterns that they're seeing. But this is showing from just a three-year span literally three years, 2013 to 2016, there's a 60% increase in depression 
in the Blue Cross network at the, a young age of 12 to 17. Ages 18 to 34, it's 50%. 35 to 49, it's 26%. So it's hitting a lot of people. It's hitting across economic spectrums. It's hitting across cultural uh, spectrums. And so we need to pay attention to why this, this depression issue is increasing because it's going to affect us or, or even ones we love. And so doctors, you think, you know, we put doctors on pedestals, um, but oftentimes they're working so hard, they are overworked, they're under-recovered. And this study was also recently, uh, this was actually from the 16th of January, just a couple weeks ago. Doctors are not immune to stress. Uh, they surveyed medical practitioners and basically, you know, it's, it's been known for a long time that burnout in the medical profession is a huge problem. I, I think we can all agree, if we look at the type of schedule that an ER doctor has to have and just to be available at beck and call for that pager to go off and to have some life-threatening event that they have to intervene on, um, you know, once in a while I think we can handle that, but I think if that was something an individual had to endure day in and day out, week after month after year, that could start, I, I would see myself burnt out, right? I think that's a pretty heavy toll to pay um, serving humanity. So we need people out there patching holes and putting limbs back on in the middle of the night, unfortunately, because accidents happen. But, you know, your, your medical doctor, they are not, not immune to this type of an issue. And so even healthcare professionals who have a high level of training don't yet quite understand um, the most optimal way to, to treat their brain, right? They may not have ever had that education. So the, the ideas in this video uh, will add a lot of ammunition to that, that idea. And, this one caught my eye mainly because one in, se one in seven uh, medical doctors that were interviewed said they had contemplated suicide, you know. I mean, that, not to be too morbid, but that seems like a high number to me. Seems like that's a, a very difficult job. And so talking about depression inevitably brings up the idea of, you know, chemical compounds. And chemical compounds, we've all heard of Prozac, maybe we've heard of SSRIs, we've heard of lithium, we've heard of maybe benzodiazepines. There's a whole... Um, you know, smorgasbord of, of chemicals out there that science has developed that interfere with brain chemistry and that can make some things change. And for some individuals, maybe at the far end of the spectrum, that is an excellent choice, at least in the short to medium term. But I would argue that pr probably every individual that's ever been diagnosed with a mental health condition, um, if th the brain is the only thing you look at, I would imagine that their diet, their leaky gut, infections, their stress level, their ability to sleep. I would imagine there's so many other holes in the bucket that could be addressed um, that would undoubtedly have an effect on brain function. And so this is a big study that came out uh, about 10 years ago in the Journal of American Medical Association. Basically what it said, they compared the effect of placebo, which is, you know, different experts have a different opinion in the low 30s, 33%, 34% of the time, the placebo effect works. And they, they were able to compare that effect of the placebo to a common SSRI type medication and they realized that there was literally no difference in the effect that these uh, medications had. Okay, So what does it mean? Does it mean that there, we, don't need, we need to get rid of the field of, of psychiatry and get rid of medications? I certainly am not advocating that. But probably 90 to 95 percent of people who are given medications could do a lot of other work that they would never need the medication to begin with. And we don't know what the long-term side effects of being on these kind of medications are. We're, we're the first generation, you know, not first generation, maybe the first epoch, the first era of human beings taking these substances for decades. We don't know what it does uh, down the road. And, and if anybody uh, in the audience or anyone out there listening has, you know, kind of peeked onto our YouTube channel and seen some of the information we've provided, there's a huge connection between your digestive system, the gut nervous system, the bugs that live in your intestine, and how your brain works. It's a huge, huge connection. And it's not an opinion, right? It's really where all the science is going. So this came out literally, this is a study released a month ago in PubMed. And what's interesting is this basically, they're showing you throughout lifetime. So, so tracking left to right, you're looking at the age, the development, the maturity of an individual. And in the beginning of life, you know, after birth, uh, you develop language and then a few years later, you're a toddler, you social interaction. And then, you know, as a teenager, it's all, it seems to be more focused on self-control. And as you become a young adult and a fully grown individual, you, you work more on cognition and, you know, you start to mature in different ways. 
And so what, this, what these researchers figured out was that as life progresses, the gut changes. And your digestive system, your, uh, your brain, the white matter in your brain, it's all, it's all developing at the same time. It's not like your brain waits for the gut to develop and then it develops. They're, they're, they're happening at the same time. So the digestive system has a huge impact and it, communi it communicates to your brain through the food you eat, toxins you're exposed to, through the bacteria, the viruses, the microorganisms that are in your digestive system. And so what they're concerned about from a, from a research PhD level perspective is, they, the idea is what's, what, what's happening to our digestive system as a, as a culture with the food that we eat, the GMO, the processing, the fake colors, which, you know, when you eat artificial colors, you're eating literally heavy metals. You know, it's really interesting that titanium and aluminum and these other chemicals are, are used to make candy change colors. Because we know from a sales point of view, if a candy is like a glowing cyan, super bright color, um, if baby fires more dopamine in our brain and we want to eat that Skittle versus a Skittle that just happens to be colored naturally. It's like the brighter color gets more attention. Um, and somebody already figured that out. So this is the, the background that we're all living in. And interestingly enough, just to, to maybe expand on the idea of gut and brain, another one of my favorite studies that I've uncovered over the last few years. This study basically said, um, and it was kind of shocking, that what they did was they looked at uh, several th thousands of people, and they looked at people that have had like one to two antibiotic doses in their whole life, and it's actually hard for me now in practice to find anybody. I could stand in a room with 500 people and ask them, have they had, who here in this room has had only two antibiotic doses in their lifetime? There aren't that many people. And then they categorized another group that had had two to five, and then five and beyond. And what they discovered was if you would have five, up to five, up to five doses of antibiotics, and they were only really looking at penicillin, uh, which in the grand scheme of things is not the most uh, strongest, it's not the strongest antibiotic out there. There's a lot more um, aggressive stuff. So if you had had five doses of penicillin in your lifetime, you had then increased your risk of anxiety and depression by 50%. And I'm thinking, man, I've... I'm sure I've had five rounds, right? And I'm, I've been healthy for, you know, a, a decade and a half. I've been, you know, I haven't, it's not like it's, it was something I was doing, you know, once a year as a kid, but I know that I had a few. And I meet patients that have had 100. They, they'll look me in the eye and I'll say, you know, ask the question often, you know, how many rounds of antibiotics do you think you've, you've had in your life? And they just sort of cackle and laugh. And they go, oh, you don't want, you know, can you believe it? It's been over 100, you know? And it's like, I, I actually, sadly, I guess I do. You know, but to be the doctor that keeps giving somebody the same medication a hundred times. Interesting. So if you see this connection, it's basically saying that if you, if you harm your gut, you harm your brain. Another reference um, out there, a few, more, a few years old, but basically this was based on reports, anecdotal reports that uh, doctors were getting. They were prescribing antibiotics to their patients. And, and antibiotics were um, basically, some of the side effects were quite strange. You know, you would think with an antibiotic, and I, I know some of you in this room maybe, maybe know somebody who's, who's had this issue, but they might get a rash or they might get diarrhea from the antibiotic or get bloated. Um, but what this study was basically saying was there's actually this whole, this whole list of neuropsychiatric issues, anxiety, panic attacks, major depression, psychosis, delirium, that are being blamed on the side effect of antibiotics. So do we, it, it, it begs the question, right? Is it the antibiotic getting into their brain? Or is that the antibiotic changes the digestive system so vastly, so quickly, that the brain changes right along with it? And that's, of course, my opinion, is knowing how closely the brain and gut are when, they, when we develop and as our body grows, the change in gut environment changes your brain. Simple as that. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating we live in a society without antibiotics. But again, the patient who has taken a hundred rounds of antibiotics, you have to remember, they were prescribed antibiotics a hundred different times. You start to think after the 12th or 15th time, maybe it's not, maybe there's some other issue that we could work on to, to maybe re re remove the need for this person to take that medication. So just giving you the background. The background is that your gut changes your brain. Okay? 
So more data on this, again, pretty recent study. And this one was catching my eye because it's showing over time from the 1990s to 2016, 26 years, it's not just that the total number of people are experiencing mental health issues. We don't just, it's not growing proportionally to our, our population. There's literally more people as a percentage of our community that are dealing with mental health issues. And dopamine is a central player in why people go to the doctor and say, I don't feel good. It's a central player in why we don't sleep. It's a central player in why we're depressed and why we have cravings and why we have addictions and why we get angry and why we get aggressive. It's an amazing chemical that doesn't seem to have the same um, appreciation that serotonin has. And ironically, serotonin, based on the research we see and we do, it's actually not that big of an influence on your, on your brain. Dopamine has a much, much, much bigger influence on your brain. You just compare these, these two ideas. Someone without serotonin might be depressed. Someone without dopamine will die. Just that simple. You can, you, in your brain, if you don't have much serotonin, you, you'll have some issues. You'll have some symptoms. You'll have apathy. Your libido will go away. You may be chronically fatigued. Uh, you would possibly be prescribed an SSRI. But literally, if the dopamine in your body disappeared, you're dead. What happens to, to unfortunately, um, the late stage Parkinson's? It's really, really difficult. Um, as people progress through Parkinson's, they ultimately may end up with dementia and their body shuts down because without dopamine firing neurons, the heart doesn't beat as well. The lungs don't, the diaphragm doesn't move as well. The gut stops working. And so I don't say that just, you know, for shock value. It's just, there's a, there's a contrast there. One thing is literally critical for life. The other thing that we mostly know about isn't as powerful of a neurotransmitter. So hopefully uh, here in the next, you know, 45 minutes, you'll have a better appreciation for, for all that dopamine can do. Which brings us to understanding how much dopamine there is. So ironically, um, I, have a, I have a reference not in this uh, slideshow that says that of all the monoamines, all the serotonin, histamine, dopamine molecules in your brain, dopamine is the most abundant. So that's, what one, that's the opinion of one researcher. And I, and I could buy that. Um, dopamine is found in your bloodstream. It's released in your gut. It's in your brain. Problem is, though, the cells in your brain that make dopamine are not very numerous. They are only 400,000, which in a system that has billions and billions and billions of cells, 400,000 is a teeny tiny little amount. It's only made between your ears. You use dopamine in your frontal lobe, okay? The frontal lobe of your brain is where the, a lot, most of your dopamine is released. It happens to be made. Like if you open your mouth and say, ah, oh, that your uvula is jiggling, if you drew a line backwards and between your ears, that's where you're going to hit dopamine producing area of your brain. So 400,000, that's all we get. You're, you're born with 400,000 dopamine containing neurons. And what happens is you have 60% of them are lost by the time you're diagnosed with Parkinson's. So that puts you at, uh, you know, what, 160,000. That's not very much in a system with billions and billions of cells. And then just curious, you know, what the uh, recent research would say, how many brain cells do we have? Um, well, they, they say we have about six, 16 billion um, neurons in the cortex in our brain. So 400,000 out of 16 billion, a drop, literally, guys, a drop in the bucket, right? That's the idea. So dopamine is something that even though it's like a, you know, it's a word you maybe don't use when you go back to your family reunions and hang out with your friends on, on the weekends, um, it's something that everybody can relate to. We've all felt dopamine. The recent research has this idea of prediction error. And I really like this idea, and I'll do my best to explain it here. So a prediction error basically is when you have an expectation of something happening, and you build a model in your head of what that expectation is, if reality matches, supersedes that expectation, or fall short of that expectation, the effect on your brain is gigantically different. It's completely different in those three scenarios. So we're going to go through a couple slides here. But basically, what you're looking at is a spike in dopamine. And that's what that little black pile of dopamine looks like on the screen. Okay, So that's your little dopamine flood. 
I have a better slide next coming up. But you can see that 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 is bigger than this. Yeah, it, it stands out. So in this in this experiment on A, the mouse had no expectation of what of the treat it was getting, and it got a treat, and it squirted a bunch of dopamine out, and the researchers measured that. They go, hey, look, no expectation, nice big reward. Wow, you know, feels good to get something that you didn't expect. But the, mou the mouse is no dummy. It gets trained to expect that reward. And if the reward that it's given is equal to the reward that it expected, it doesn't really give that much. So this is the expectation, actually. It releases dopamine at the expectation. But when the reward is given, there's no, th there's no increase in dopamine. Okay. And this will, this will make more sense on this next slide, too. I think so they do a better job of, of highlighting this. So ironically, your expectations control a large degree what your, your happiness, right? So I think this is maybe the reason behind, you know, monks and, and you know, like her, hermits and people, or, or just very people who figured out how to, like, keep their life very simple. And don't need much. Because then if you don't need much, everything you get is a gift. And you get dopamine from everything. A bird can land on the fence and you get a big burst of dopamine. or, you know, what, what, It could be anything if you keep your expectations in check. So what I'm not saying is you know, don't have expectations for an amazing, awesome life. But I'm saying if you can go into any situation with low expectations and then give it 100%, that seems to be the best way to make dopamine based on the science. right? Lack, lack of attachment to the outcome. Having, you know, just go give it your all without an attachment, love yourself and have a good time, you'll just have dopamine no matter what. But if you say, I have to win at no, at no matter what the cost, you're in, you're in for a rough ride, right? Or if you just have a, a really negative outlook and say, you know, I, you know, if you just have bad self-talk that lowers your expectations, um, you'll probably hit that target. But what this shows is, again, experiments, untrained, untrained mouse. Gets a big reward, oh boy, feels good. Feels real good, man. I got a lot of dopamine. The mouse got its, got its hit, got its high, it feels good. And the reason that worked, the reason you get that much dopamine in this part of the experiment is because there was no expectation of what was coming. The unknown, things coming from your peripheral vision you didn't expect, that gifts coming at you, you're like, something good happens, it's just, you know, an unexpected positive thing happening to you is usually more impactful in your life than the expected positive. Can we all agree? Once they train the mouse, once they train the mouse, you can see that the the dopamine spike is still there, but you know, it's 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 not as big. And they keep doing the experiment, it just sort of it goes away. They give the reward. The reward's still happening. There's just no excitement anymore. Your child begs you for a toy, just emotionally, articulately describes a toy, how fun it would be. Maybe the toy comes at a birthday party or at a holiday, and they're excited. The dopamine floods for about 48, maybe 72 hours, and now the toy's in the closet because the reward was expected, the reward was given, and then the next, the next need for dopamine uh, comes along, and, and it's, it's just funny how our, our minds are, right? We all, we've all done that. Um, so it's all about prediction error, okay? Which has to do with your expectation. That's what the research is showing. So I don't think we would, anybody could argue with that. If your expectations are properly you know, in, in place. So for example, if you expect to have $20 in your wallet, you open your wallet and you see that there's 60, you just might, someone might just look over and see you grinning. Wow, that's 60 bucks, man, that's cool. You got a lot more dopamine. Now, if you expect money in your wallet and you expect there's 20 bucks, and you open your wallet, he goes, my $20 still there? Oh, OK, good. Still there. You got a little bit of dopamine. Whew. Dodged a bullet. But if you expected to have 20 bucks and you open your wallet and there's just $2 in there, you literally are depressed momentarily based on neuroscience. OK? Expectations, they can help you, but I think most of the time they bite you in the butt, you know? So in our practice, we do a lot of work with genetics. And Again, not to get too nerdy on this whole thing, and I promise that even though dopamine is a complicated subject, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it so that I'm going to move this. I'm going to make it so that uh, it makes sense. But basically, what this bell this is a curve. As we can all see, there's a curve there, and it shows different genetic markers that we're not going to get into in this video, but we've gone into in other areas. But basically, 
we are born with genes that either make dopamine stay in our brain longer or make it go out faster. That's just that simple. If you have the green gene here, dopamine goes into your brain, it bounces around for a few minutes and it's gone. If you have the plus minus, it stays in your brain a little bit longer. And if you have the plus plus, well, it, will, it could rattle around in your brain a lot longer. Maybe twice as long, maybe three times. We don't really know. We just know that it makes a big difference. You add in uh, hormone imbalances, menopausal issues, stress issues, estrogen toxicity, gut infections, and this whole thing gets complicated, but it really all affects dopamine, okay? And what I like about this study the most, this, is, this, is, this kind of frames the issue for me. People say, Doc, man, I, I, I've, got, I've got brain fog, man. It's not you, I'm not used to being this way. I've got brain fog. I can't think straight. I'm not, I'm not clear. Um, and I just feel depressed. I hear that a lot. And then they might say, I have insomnia, I have chronic pain, or I have panic attacks, or I have severe cravings, I have addiction issues, I have drug abuse issues. They might add a lot to that statement of, hey, I have brain fog and I'm depressed. But what I want to share with the audience is that brain fog and depression as a symptom cannot tell you whether you have high or low dopamine. Okay? That, those two things are, you, are the same whether you have low dopamine or whether you have high dopamine. What I'm trying to say is this. This is your brain function on a, on a line. They've made a model of brain and they made it really simple. Between this dotted line and that dotted line, your brain is optimum. That's why it looks like a nice big spike. It's nice and clean, okay? That's optimum brain function. If you can keep your dopamine between these two points, you're going to test better, you're going to sing better, draw better, ath be athletic better, you're going to have a better conversation, you're going to solve problems better, you're going to think better. Everything you do in your life will be better because you have the optimum amount of dopamine in your brain and you can concentrate, you can be your best version of yourself, okay? That's the whole point. If you can keep dopamine in this sweet spot, you're going to have the best version of yourself, of your brain function. But if dopamine is too low, your brain gets scattered. It doesn't focus. It lacks focus. If you have too much dopamine, the same thing happens. So you, you have really two examples. And I use, the, I use the analogy of, I've never been to Germany. Uh, I'd like to go sometime. But at least while the Autobahn still doesn't have a speed limit. I know they're always trying to like put a speed limit on stuff. You know, just let it, just leave it alone. It's cool. There's nobody play, no other place like that in the world. Just let them, let them drive 160 if they want to. But let's say you're on the Autobahn and you see a Ferrari on the side of the road. Smoke's coming out of the, out of the engine. The guy's just standing there going, you know, he's got a worried look on his face. Blinkers are on. You're like, ah, oh, you know, sucks to be that guy. Keep going. And, and he was driving way too fast for way too long didn't maintain his car, and he overheated the engine, and then it just shut off. So we had to pull over the side of the road, blinkers on. You go past that guy like a mile down the road, and you see another Ferrari, you know, same year, same model, same color. And the guy's just sitting there in his car with his blinkers on. He just ran out of gas. What's an easier problem to fix? Put, put gas in the car, right? But the, the moral of the story is they're both on the side of the road. They're both not working well. So that's analogous to brain. The first example is a brain that got overstimulated with too much dopamine, and it's depressed, a la sitting on the side of the road not going very fast, its speed is depressed, or it ran out of gas, and it's also depressed. So those are the two ways we treat dopamine. It affects our IQ, okay, white matter. There, and, and this is maybe a little more complicated than I want to get into, but basically, they're try researchers are figuring out that if an individual has dopamine that stays here, in this range and doesn't like flood too high and doesn't drain out too far. They test really well. They're smart people. They get te they test for a very high IQ and when they look at their brain, they have more white matter in their brain. So it's not about having an infinitely high amount of dopamine. It's <coughs> it's also not about having a deficiency. You want to be in the middle of the the middle dopamine availability had the largest white matter volume in the prefrontal cortex. So what they're saying is what I'm trying to communicate. Dopamine is a seesaw, and your goal is to get into the middle. And by the time you're done with this talk, you'll, you'll, it'll make sense. We, it's a bell curve. And the research hints at this. These are their lines. These are their charts. They're showing us curves for how dopamine works. And it just, it's, just a, it's a beautiful model, a simple model that makes sense. This is just another piece of data that said basically too high or too low level of dopamine leads to errors. So they're testing people. 
They're saying, how good is this person's memory? We show you a bunch of pictures, match them up, just like a game, you know? Or, you know, remember these numbers. And people who are really good at that testing, they figure out that dopamine is in the optimum range. But when their dopamine is low, their dopamine is too high, it's not. So think of somebody you know who's really smart. Maybe you do, maybe kids, friends, family. And they just are really bad at taking tests because they're just nervous, right? So they get nervous because if they don't pass this test, then they won't get into this school, or they'll have to do this again, blah, blah, blah. There's just like these hundred consequences that will never happen, and all they should be doing is focusing on this test. So if they create the stress and they raise their dopamine level, they're going to get dumber the day that they take the test. And they go, man, I bombed that test. I'm like, well, were you stressed out about it? Well, yeah, of course I was. It's super important. I got to pass boards. I got to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, you know, looking back, you know, if you would have gone and done some acupuncture, gotten an adjustment, went and played tennis for a couple hours and taken the day off before the test, you, you probably have done a lot better. You'd be a lot more relaxed. And they've proven that. They've proven that people taking tests in school, you know, you go do acupuncture or go get massage, do something relaxing, your test scores go up like 30%. So the point is, if we're stressed out, our brain works less effectively. And dopamine is what we release in our brain when we're stressed out. So of all the tools and models I've come up with in practice, this is my favorite one, probably the, the most... Uh, the thing that I'm most proud of, and really what it is, it's this bell curve that you've seen on this screen already tonight. I just changed the shape a little bit. The bell curve makes more sense to me. So you have low dopamine here, you have middle dopamine here, and you have high dopamine here. We have the symptoms associated with each situation above the stars. So low catecholamine people, that's another way for saying low dopamine, they have a set of characteristics that define them. Okay, food cravings, absolutely 100% without a doubt, you, that's related to the need for dopamine in the brain. When you have low blood sugar, you get low dopamine in your brain. It has to do with how insulin allows you to make neurotransmitters. So when your blood sugar is low, your insulin is low, your dopamine is low. Your brain doesn't care what Dr. Oz says, it doesn't care what I say, it doesn't care what your doctor recommended or what agreements you've already made, what contracts you have with yourself. It says, raise my dopamine right now, or I'm going to have a problem. And so you go and look into your pantry. You go and look at the, you go to the break room at work, and you see a carbohydrate or a sugar. And, and your brain goes, that's the fastest way to raise dopamine. Put it in my mouth right now. And it's effective within seconds. Um, practically the second that sugar hits the tongue, <laughs> you start making more dopamine. So... ADD, ADHD, addiction, substance abuse, anger, excessive sleepiness. You're going to see there's some polar opposites here. Some things they will share. Remember, high, high and low dopamine share brain fog and depression. They, they're both going to feel, if somebody has either one of these issues, they're both going to feel depressed and they're both going to have brain fog. But the other symptoms that color their, that flavor their life, that color their existence, are going to be very unique because low dopamine makes you feel different than high. Okay, and we're going to start with low dopamine. And again, I apologize, these talks are really very much drinking from the fire hydrant. But, you know, you catch, you catch part of it, and then you come back and watch the video if you want, and you learn some more. We're creatures of habit, all right? How the heck did we live without smartphones? We, are, we don't need chips in our arms or under our hand to track us and listen to our conversations. We carry it in our pocket. You're not paranoid if they are out to get you, by the way. That's a phrase I heard a long time ago, and it stuck with me. But literally, every like you get on Facebook, every little retweet, you set yourself up to either feel good because people are liking your popular post or feeling bad because nobody <coughs> paid any attention to it. And honestly, I'm, I'm, not, any, I'm not above this. Um, if I put something on YouTube and, it, and nobody watches it, it makes me feel sad. I have an expectation that people will watch it. I have set my expectations. My reward prediction is here, and I really hope I do enough of the good work to get it at least to match or maybe exceed my expectations. And then what do I get? Dopamine, yeah, dopamine, it's so amazing. So yes, smartphones are addictions. 
Men, due to the differences between testosterone and estrogen, men are more susceptible to low dopamine. I don't want to make anyone feel uh, upset or, you know, point anything out that might offend anyone, but in my general opinion, men tend to be more grumpy. They make a movie called Grumpy Old Men. I haven't seen the movie Grumpy Old Women yet. I don't know if it exists. The reason men are grumpy is that we need dopamine. And when you get grumpy and you start a fight in an argument, what do you think happens to your dopamine? It goes up or down? It goes up. It's self-medication. Isn't that interesting? A toddler in the corner, kicking, screaming, throwing toys, being completely ridiculously obstinate, might be hungry, right? Might just be a hungry child. And what happens when you put food in someone's mouth? What happens to their dopamine level? It goes back up. I'm telling you what, anger, grumpiness, low dopamine, okay? It's amazing. Our behavior is literally all self-medication. So men are more susceptible to low dopamine, ADD, ADHD, you're going to see that. And so I like to point out that low catecholamines, low dopamine is really causes depression of the brain, right? Not I feel blue, want to paint the color blue, listen to heavy metal music, whatever. Dopamine will make you depressed if you don't have enough of it or if you have too much of it. But definitely... The lack of dopamine means the brain is not active enough and it's depressed in function. So it, before I learned, you know, had my education, became a doctor, I always thought depression was like a feeling, right? That's all I just conceptualized it as. But from a neurological point of view, dopamine, or depression means your brain is firing too slow. The speed of the brain is depressed. That's the medical concept of depression. It doesn't, those are just two different ideas. So. We, we give a lot of, of we, like I said earlier, we give a lot of um, focus on serotonin, but I'm, I'm of the opinion that dopamine is ultimately more important. It has way more impact on our lives. Um, as I said earlier, ADD, ADHD is more common in boys. The only difference is the X and Y chromosome, which basically testosterone and estrogen. Testosterone makes dopamine leave your body faster. That's what happens. Estrogen makes dopamine stay in your brain longer. So the children, I never understood how, even before, again, when I was years ago, I never understood how kids with ADD who had, an, who had hyperactivity were given a stimulant. Does that not sound counterintuitive? Why would you give somebody a stimulant who's already hyperactive? Well, I didn't understand how the brain worked. And now you have an idea of how that works. Think of the bell curve. That they're, they're down at the bottom of the bell curve. You have to stimulate their brain to get them up into the middle and then all of a sudden their frontal lobe goes, that's a bad behavior. That's a dumb thing to do. I'm just going to sit down and do my work and focus. But without the dopamine in the optimum range, they're bouncing off the walls, trying to self-stimulate. Two to four times higher in men than women. Ironically, I'm not promoting the medication. I'm just pointing out, 90% of the time, if you give a child with ADD or ADHD medication to treat it, it's effective. That's a pretty good number. If I was selling medication, I'd be proud of that, right? But what's missing in that concept is that by raising dopamine, you're 90% effective because that's what the medication does. Ritalin is basically a derivative of methamphetamine. It's, it's very similar. It raises, it raises dopamine. That's all the medication does. So if you, raise, if you have kids eat a different kind of food, they eat more frequently and give them more protein, give them some B vitamins, they might actually make a lot more dopamine on their own. They probably never need that stuff. Aggressive and defensive behaviors. The, the angry toddler me metaphor everybody I think can relate to. The grumpy old man, I think we can all, you know, curmudgeon is a label that men tend to get a lot more than females. I think we can all agree. That doesn't offend anybody. It's, it's just low dopamine. And it's all self-medication. You get grumpy with everybody, you want to pick a fight, well, you just get a little burst of dopamine every time you butt heads with somebody. Self-medication. So studies just kind of basically proved the same thing. The researchers weren't really, they were kind of surprised. They thought that the higher dopamine people would be more aggressive, but they actually, they're not. It's the low dopamine uh, participants in this study that were the more, they got more frustrated and more aggressive and grumpy. 
And so when you're trying to, as I'm sharing these ideas with you, what I'm, what I'm hoping to take home from, from all of this is that you think about people in your life, think about yourself, your children, your friends, and people who want to improve their health. And you start thinking about these, these characteristics of their daily life. They're telling you what their problem is through their symptoms, through how they sleep, how they interact with their friends. I mean, everything tells a story. The body won't text us. It won't write it, write it down in, a, you know, in an essay. It won't write a list, but it'll telegraph through its symptoms what's going on. And if we do a better job of learning that, then we can read it better. But a big part of this uh, model we use in our office is the sleep component. Now, most people who need my help don't sleep enough. I'm going to just point that out right away. That's a much more unhealthy and unhappy group of people are the people who sleep too little. But there are people who sleep too much. If I had a magic vacuum cleaner and I went around and stuck it next to your head and pulled all the dopamine out, you'd fall asleep momentarily until it recharged every single time. So the person who falls asleep, sleeps too much, sleeping all the time, do they have an adrenal issue? Yes, they probably do. But remember, adrenals make cortisol and adrenaline, and adrenaline comes from dopamine. So there's a correlation. So from the dopamine point of view, when you, when you deplete catecholamines, you create people that just fall asleep. Drop a hat. I used to be this person. I'd go in a car ride for five minutes, must sleep. Sleep on the plane, sleep in the car, sleep after lunch at school, sleep, sleep, sleep. I never realized this was my problem, low dopamine. Could have fixed that. But, you know, now I get to help other people fix it. So amphetamine suppresses sleep attacks. So what we're saying is, again, the, the medication or the drug that's often used for ADD, ADHD, the drug that, you know, speed people take to stay up all night, well, obviously, the only way you're able to stay up all night is because you change your dopamine level. So it's just all it's doing is highlighting the connection between sleep and dopamine. The people in your life who sleep too much don't have enough dopamine. That's the, that's the way it goes. And I'll, t I'll show you at the, here in a few minutes that the opposite is true of people with high dopamine. Okay, more data, same thing. You deplete dopamine, here's what you get. Sleepiness, fatigue, sedation. These people are not motivated. They're losing motivation. They're not psyched to go out and exercise. They don't want to implement the, you know, the New Year's uh, challenge. They're just, they're apathetic. They don't have the chemicals in their brain to drive them out and go do something fun. Hey, you want to go do something fun today? No, I, I just hang out in the house, keep my jammies on, you know, stay in my sweats. And it's not necessarily that they have, they want to avoid you. It might be that they don't have enough dopamine and therefore there's no way for them to make that happen, okay? And just again, more studies, they use dogs in this case, but basically, I've had a patient that, that had this problem before. She would go to parties and she would just fall asleep on a couch. She'd sit down and play with friends and be asleep in like three minutes. And the parents were just like, what's going on, you know? You know, it wasn't like a toddler, kind of like a, you know, mid, mid school kid, uh, middle school age kid. And we just determined based on that, that characteristic of her falling asleep at really strange times, she was low in dopamine. We gave her some L-tyrosine, some methylated B vitamins, and it never happened again. So lo raising dopamine is easier than bringing it down. I'll go ahead and say that. That's why I'm talking about the easy one first. Raising dopamine is easier than bringing it down. We already know if you keep your expectations in check and you have an, an error in your prediction, you'll raise dopamine. Um, you can raise it with food. You can raise it with uh, keeping your blood sugar stable. L-tyrosine is a great choice. Methylated B vitamins like methylfolate, absolutely essential to make dopamine. It's a cofactor. So those are good choices. But food is really a drug, right? The, the, sto the story is if, if sugar was sort of submitted to the FDA today, high fructose corn syrup as an ingredient, it would be labeled as a drug. And the people that make food know that they're really, they're, their only goal at the end of the year is to be in the black, to be in the black as much as possible and to sell as much food as possible. That's their goal. Their goal isn't to feed you, nourish you, help you, um, you know, live a long, healthy, amazing life on, on Earth. And what this is basically saying is that um, as individuals lose control over their diet, as they become obese, they get a blunted response from dopamine. So again, the same story. Someone who's lean and healthy body composition eats a meal, they get X amount of dopamine, okay? An obese person, due to the effect that food has had on their system for so long, they eat the same food and they get that much dopamine. So they have to increase the quantity of food, the caloric quantity of that, in order to get the same satisfaction in their brain. And so it just it's the same process you're going to see when we look at uh, addiction. So food hits the same part of our brain that drugs do. Caffeine is great. 
um, I don't think it's a negative thing. But I think if you have an adrenal problem and you're skipping meals and you're just drinking coffee to get by and you're eating once a day and having four espressos, yeah, that'll hurt you. No question about that. Um, is, the, is, is coffee great for everybody on earth at all times? Of course it's not. But if we took coffee away from our society, you know, I jokingly say you, you know, the planes would probably fall out of the sky and Amazon packages wouldn't show up in two days. You know, I mean, caffeine keeps, it's like grease is the wheel of cap, wheels of capitalism over here. But it raises dopamine. That's why caffeine works. You drink caffeine, you get more dopamine. That's what caffeine does. Caffeine by itself doesn't alert your brain. It just causes the release of dopamine, which perks you up. Addiction. Doesn't matter what the drug is. I should say, or food. It doesn't matter what the food or the drug is. Methamphetamine, nicotine, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, morphine. They all do the same thing. They all raise dopamine. All addictions do the same thing. It doesn't matter what the drug is. It doesn't matter what the name is. It doesn't matter what the processed food is. They all raise dopamine. The dopamine is all the same. How you get there is your own choice. Right? The dopamine that's released when someone uh, uses cocaine in their brain is no different than the dopamine that's released when they do heroin or when they eat Pop-Tarts. It's all this, the dopamine in your brain is the same, but how, it get, how we release it is different. And yeah, that would probably make me a little bit nervous, right? Most people in this room would think, I mean, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute attached to you is kind of passe. It's sort of a mild adventure now. You can go skydiving anywhere. If you really want adrenaline, that's what you do, right? Like the most dangerous sport ever invented, wingsuiting. But obviously they have a deficiency of dopamine and they've decided that this is the best way to go get it. And the first jump, it's like a shot of heroin. It must have been a lot of fun, exhilarating. Maybe it was pretty high and they go, you know what, bro, next time we gotta go even higher, man. Higher and farther. Because what would happen if they just jumped off the same size cliff in a safe way every time? Their dopamine level would go meh, meh, meh. And so the need for speed, the need to push it, the need to push the limits, it's just the need to get that same level of dopamine. It's an addiction. I can't say, they're, they're, you know, you're free to do with your, with your life what you want to do, and it's kind of fun to watch, you know, interesting. But the, the, if all the dopamine is the same, the, the question is, should you, should you pick your drug or should you pick your side effect? Again, drugs. Catecholamine and drug abuse. We're going to run through a few of these just to honor our, our time here. Kermit's had a rough day. Yeah, he, He's been in Napa Valley way too long, had too much fun. Um, but basically, a low availability of dopamine associated with a high level of craving. Okay, That's the research that we're using to build this model, and it makes sense. People with cravings are asking for dopamine. When you have a craving at 3 in the afternoon, and you like, you're on your diet, and then you go and eat a bag of chips, the question you should ask is am, I a bad, not, is, am I a bad person or not, is why did I let my dopamine level drop? What did I do wrong? And then we can fix that, and you can, you can avoid that craving. Same story, okay? So maybe I put too much info here on the low dopamine side. I'm going to make sure we run through this. But basically what happened, this is kind of a picture that sort of explains what's going on. This person is a low novelty seeker. They don't want to jump off a cliff with a wingsuit attached to their body. They don't want to do heroin. They don't want to do dangerous drugs. They don't want to risk their life in extreme sports because their dopamine system just already is in the right spot. But when somebody else does it and they get this absolute flood of dopamine when they try something new, they get hooked because their brain can't control the flow of dopamine as effectively. So it's just like this euphoric, euphoric high, but then it starts to cr drop them down and crash. So, the goal in this whole thing of balancing your brain is not to let your brain be on a roller coaster where you have big highs and big lows. They give those labels, bipolar, manic, you know, great, great label. How, how do we fix it is the question, right? And if somebody's having big highs and big lows, they're having a lot of dopamine and then a little bit of dopamine and it's flooding in and out, okay? So I, I built this chart just maybe to help myself understand um, how this would work. So here's the red line, and this is the optimum brain function. Everybody understands that. We'll get to this blue area here shortly. That's high catecholamine people. But 
I often get the question, okay, Dr. Rashford, I get it. Low dopamine, you know, you got cravings, you're sleepy all the time, you may be grumpy, kind of just like, you know, don't want to go do anything, your, your, your motivation's low, but sometimes, and I see that as myself, but sometimes I have anxiety for a few minutes and I feel anxious. Isn't that just a high dopamine problem too? How can you have symptoms of both? How can you have symptoms of low dopamine and also high? And the reason why is this. It's a great question, and I had to think about it and uh, go back and understand how that would work. But basically, when you have a little bit of dopamine, like this blue, you have a lot of receptors, the yellow, because your body's starving for dopamine, so it sprouts little receptors everywhere and it's trying to grab whatever dopamine's up there it wants to connect with, right? And as you move to the left to the right, the amount of receptors goes down because you don't need as many because the number of dopamine molecules goes up. And as you get to the high end where you have a whole lot of dopamine, you really don't have that many receptors. Does everybody see that model? Yeah? So if you're down here, like just scraping the bottom of the barrel, and you've got all these receptors, and then something really stressful happens, you get a really bad phone call about a sick family member, or you, know, you have a relationship change, or you have some exciting news maybe that was even, you, know, you don't feel like you're ready for, you suddenly burst a bunch of dopamine into your brain, and you have all these receptors ready, and it just makes you feel anxious for a short period of time, but eventually your body will then regulate. You'll come back into your equilibrium of being low dopamine. So yes, you can have symptoms of both, but it's what symptoms dominate that makes the most, that's most important. Oh, I had anxiety one day last month. Am I, high am I high dopamine person? No, because 28 days, you sleep in for 12 hours, you have cravings all the time, you're lethargic, um, you know, and you can't focus, and you're, you're grumpy. So that, that makes you a low, a low dopamine person. So I digress, but that question may come up. So again, just more, more studies on dopamine reward. It's everybody who's doing drugs, everybody who's jumping off of cliffs, everybody who's doing extreme force, everybody who's driving motorcycles 160 miles an hour, everybody who's uh, you know, trying to blow stuff up and just do crazy things. They're just trying to raise dopamine. That's what I want everybody in this audience to understand. They're self-medicating. There's a thousand, maybe there's a million ways to raise dopamine. Some ways are good and have great side effects. Other ways, you know, if, if, if shooting heroin led you to a, a great retirement, a, a longevity, a, a good, you know, healthy body, mind, and spirit, I would certainly recommend it to my patients. It's the side effect that's killing you, right? So pay attention to the side effects of how you get dopamine. And this, is, this has to do with marijuana. I mean... It's not, a, it's not a harmless substance, and I think something that was used ceremonially wasn't necessarily intended to be used 10 times a day. You know, maybe, maybe that's the way I look at it. But the, more, uh, the, the, the less dopamine you have, the more apathy you have. The typical stoner phenotype, if you will, is a fairly apathetic person. They've, they've blasted their brain with so much uh, stimulation with the marijuana that all the dopamine receptors are just gone, and so they're just very apathetic. The motivation is fairly low. Um, to say nothing of the medical benefits, just speaking strictly neurologically, um, if you do a drug that, because see, THC raises dopamine. CBD oil does have no, has nothing to do with dopamine. In fact, it actually lowers it. But THC is a drug that raises dopamine. So if you're having high THC marijuana all the time, you're getting, that's why people get anxious, they get paranoid, they even have a higher risk for schizophrenia doing marijuana because it raises dopamine. <coughs> all right. I've said dopamine a lot already, and we're just halfway through, so bear with me, okay? We're gonna, have, we're, gonna, we're gonna run through this. And so now that I've articulated the low dopamine person, you, you see the research kind of backs this. There's cravings, addictions, all these issues, and sleepiness. And we look at the opposite end of the spectrum. This, probably 20% of the people that I help. This, 80%. This group has more of an acute, I need help now, this is ruining my life kind of experience, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So the same idea, if low dopamine means you're really sleepy, if, you're, if your catecholamines are high, you just don't sleep. You might sleep two or three hours a night. Patients have come to me and said, Doc, oh man, I, I was up for three days. I'm like, you're up for three days? You, you know, you had a long day and you went to bed and you had a little bit of sleep for three days? Like, no, man, I didn't go to sleep for three days. I'm like, how's that possible? It's not my reality, but I do know it's possible. When people have too much dopamine and they can't get rid of it, the brain will literally not stop. You will never get into a restful sleep state if dopamine is always in your head. 
Lots of data on this, which is great. Um, people who don't sleep well, there's no such thing as a night owl on planet Earth. I don't believe that's true. I believe that every person on Earth, when the sun is up, the blue light roasts your melatonin and makes the level go away. And as soon as nighttime falls, you're supposed to have a rise of melatonin, which you'll learn tonight is like an anti-dopamine agent. And so the reason, I mean, our ancestors, they slept at night. They were up during the day. It's the way it works. There's a lot of artificial light. These lights are horrible. We've been under them for, you know, what, 25, 30, 40, 50 years. They mess with our clock. But people who don't sleep have high activity of their sympathetic nervous system, and it affects the immune system. You know, if you don't sleep seven hours, your risk of getting the cold and the flu goes up by about three or four hundred percent. So when you sleep well, you, your immune system cleans house. Insomnia increases cortisol, so there's all this adrenal activation in people who aren't sleeping well. But what you need to know from this talk is not all this science. You just need to know that the people in your life who have a hard time going to bed, have a hard time staying asleep, people who never take naps, never sleep on planes, never sleep in the car, they have a, they have a high dopamine problem. And there's so much you can do to help them. So much that can be done to help them. Another negative side effect of high amounts of dopamine is that it also corresponds with high amounts of adrenaline. So I've spent most of tonight talking about dopamine. There may be someone in the audience who knows even more about dopamine than I do. It may be a, a big researcher. But I'm just keeping it simple. But under dopamine is also adrenaline. They're, they're, all the adrenaline you've ever made and you ever will make in your life is first a molecule of dopamine. So very often, people with high dopamine have high adrenaline. And adrenaline feeds bugs in your gut. So if you're constantly not sleeping, you're constantly living with all this dopamine in your brain and in your body, you, you, you get gut problems just from, the, just from those facts. If, if, if the bacteria in your gut get a chance to uh, you know, take a bath in adrenaline, and when you get stressed out, they get, they get covered with adrenaline, they grow like crazy. It's like the super bug food. So, we often see people who've been on this path of high dopamine for a long time, they've developed gut problems. They've developed an infection of excess bacteria or candida or some other type of parasite. And it's in order to help their brain, we really have to go back to their gut. This is a type of an issue that um, there's, a, there's a, a rare type of cancer that grows on your adrenal glands that basically just pumps out massive amounts of adrenaline. Has a great name, pheochromocytoma. And one of the hallmark characteristics of this is to have high anxiety. So again, high amounts of adrenaline, high amounts of dopamine correlates with people who can describe themselves as anxious. Now, the, the feeling of anxiety, we've all felt, but some people are stuck feeling it all the time. They don't, they're unable to leave their house because going out in the road and driving on the interstate creates enough extra dopamine that it's literally hitting their limit and they're, they're, they're out, they're done, right? And so what we look at that as is like everybody has a bucket that they can have dopamine in before they get symptoms. And what happens is people are coming to us with their dopamine bucket basically completely full. You add the one little stress, one little thing, and it just starts to splash out and they get all these crazy symptoms. They may have had a panic attack. They may just, you know, have a racing heartbeat, tachycardia, difficulty breathing, air hunger. There's lots of things. But when you, when you treat someone holistically and you work from the, you know, from the digestive tract into their, and making sure their detoxification is working, making sure they have enough vitamins and minerals, if you support people from a, you know, 365, 30,000 foot point of view, that bucket full of dopamine is now much lower. So they can go out and, and, and engage in the world and live a life, a uh, rewarding life, without having these negative side effects of so much dopamine knocking them around. But that's the model we use in practice. It works really well. This is just saying the same thing. Anxiety is associated with increased sympathetic nervous system activity. If you're stuck with too much dopamine, you're more, much more likely to be anxious much more likely to be worrisome all the time, to have a panic attack. A few more, three more concepts here. And again, I'm, I'm sharing these with you so that you can take this information and think about the people in your life who are not well and could be better and start to figure out are they high or low dopamine. And there's, the toolkit for the low dopamine person is different than the toolkit for the high dopamine person. If you happen to give the low dopamine person all the nutrition that we recommend 
for the op for the high dopamine person, it'll like make them sedated and they'll like pass out. It'll get worse momentarily, nothing permanent. And conversely, if you take a high dopamine person and you give them all the B vitamins and stimulating things we would give to somebody with low dopamine, man, you make they may not sleep for a week. You know, they may have a panic attack, have a headache, horrible headache, migraine. We see this with uh, with what happens in, with individuals um, experimenting with, with this stuff. But basically. One of the factors I look for when I work with patients is tingling, burning, numbness is a very common sign of high amounts of dopamine and adrenaline. This is a study that just compared two groups of firefighters. One group complained of having numbness, tingling, burning in their hands and feet. They didn't have diabetes. They don't have peripheral neuropathy. They don't have multiple sclerosis. They're firefighters. But why does one group have all these symptoms and another group not? Well, all they did was do a blood test and they compared and they said the group that didn't have symptoms, their, their blood level of adrenaline was here, and the group that did have symptoms, their blood level of adrenaline was here. And so having these catecholamines, as we call, call them in your bloodstream, is not fun. It's oxidizing, their, they, they create a lot of inflammation, they mess with your system in a large, large way. They also cause pain. So people that have pain syndromes, we think of fibromyalgia, we think of people that you can't give them a, you can't give them a hug, they say it hurts. Like, huh, oh, that was not very much pressure, but okay, you know, and I've, I've touched, you know, 3,000 people in, in practice, and, um, you know, we do, there are some very sensitive bodies out there, they do get better. But if you have too much dopamine, too much adrenaline in your system, your, your pain fibers in your body are always firing a signal of pain to your brain. You've heard the phrase, Use it or lose it. Unfortunately, if your pain fibers all over your body, your big toe, your low back, if those pain fibers don't fire, they die. If they don't get used, they die. So every second you're alive, your brain is receiving signals from the rest of your body that says, ouch, 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 pain, 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 pain. But your brain just goes, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that signal. I know nothing's wrong. There's no injury. But I know you have to fire to survive, so I'll let you send that to me, but I'm just not going to listen to it. Unfortunately, when you have a bunch of adrenaline in your body, the signal of pain, 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 ow, 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 is greatly amplified. So your brain does start to think things are hurting when there's no damage. You just ache. I don't know, I've had a stressful day or two and gotten poor sleep, and I wake up and I'm like, did I work out for three hours yesterday? I mean, what happened? I go downstairs and I'm just sore. Not very often, but I think we've all experienced that. You don't actually have to physically work your butt off and like do a three hour exercise to be sore. You can just have a stressful couple days. More ideas on that, just basically pain. And this gene I, I showed you earlier, COMT, if it's not working very well, people are in pain. They can have a lot of pain syndromes, they can have insomnias, they can have panic attacks and anxiety issues. And the research, thank goodness, um, you know, we have all this research. There's 25 million published studies. If we can't figure out how to help people after we've performed 25 million studies, we should probably stop trying. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's get to 100 million, and then we'll figure everything out. I mean, I'm not trying to be facetious, but it, the information's out there if you're willing to look. There's tons of information out there. More data on this. I'm just going to jump through this. Um, it's true. If you have epinephrine and adrenaline in your body, you're going to hurt. So individuals that you know who deal with just aches and pains and what did I do to my knee? I didn't, you know, I didn't go dancing. I didn't fall in the yard and twist it. I just woke up and it hurts. What's going on? Well, this is probably going on. There's probably more to this story. And then as I get to the end here, I just, um, schizophrenia. I have, there's an individual in my family I'm related to who was diagnosed with this. And everybody that I've ever come across or the stories I've heard, it, it, doesn't, it tends to happen when something really stressful happens to an individual's life. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't research schizophrenia. I just have come across it in my, in my readings and in my training. Medical doctors, you know, getting ready to pass their boards, get diagnosed with schizophrenia. People, uh, teenagers going through a really nasty divorce, their parents are just like, terrible people and fighting in a really horrible, nasty way, that kid gets schizophrenia. There has to be some stressful trigger that pushes them into this psychotic state. And it's really sad. It seems like, you know, we don't really have a way of helping these people very well. 
Um, just out of curiosity, you know, we study this because this is on the spectrum of high dopamine. So I showed you that chart that fits like right here. Well, if this is, you know, anxiety, and this is, let's say this is worry, this is anxiety, this is panic attack, panic attack, this is mania, and this is schizophrenia in terms of the high amount of dopamine, right? It's like off the chart, off the chart high. And I can say this confidently because every drug ever made to treat schizophrenia works on dopamine, to my, to my knowledge. I've never come across a medication ever prescribed for dopamine or schizo schizophrenia, or excuse me, for schizophrenia that worked any other way. And the research basically says the same thing. Hallucinations, illusions, delusions happen when there's increased dopamine function in the brain. Too much dopamine will make you lose your mind. They did a study back in the, I believe it was the 60s maybe, and it was by a gentleman named Abram Hoffer, who um, was a big uh, leader in this idea of using nutrition to help mental illness. I mean, he was a giant of a person. And what he did was he took adrenaline, and he, uh, one chemical reaction away from adrenaline, he would inject it into schizophrenic patients and induce a, a hallucination. So they have no hallucination, they're doing fine, and they inject adrenaline into their bloodstream and cause a hallucination. That's a pretty good correlation. I don't think ethically a, Tesla, a study like that would be allowed to go forward today, but it is interesting to read what was done in the past. And so schizophrenia, uh, we're going to shout out to Salvador Dali a couple times because it's, are artists crazy? I mean, I think they might have to be. They, may have, a, they, have, a, they have a way to control their mental illness, right? It's all about excessive dopamine, okay? This, is, this study's not even a year old. So when people lose touch with reality, when they suffer with this mania or psychosis or hallucinations, schizophrenia, it is a dopamine story. It's the far end of the spectrum that I've shared with you. It's the way far high dopamine problem, but it's still a dopamine problem. Can we help these people? Oh, I have an, I'm an optimist. I think that there's probably a lot we could do to help these individuals, but putting them in a, um, you know, inpatient treatment, feeding them gluten, feeding them soy, feeding them corn, the grossest food in the world in a very hostile, toxic environment, it's probably not a good place for healing to happen, right? Um, maybe we'll come up with a better way as a society. And again, Salvador, Sal, uh, Salvador Dali, man, I mean, that, what an imagination. But it's interesting that creativity is linked to mental illness. And what they did was they simply examined and, and looked at creative people, and they uncovered that um, relatives of those with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder are overrepresented in creative professions. So, you know, artists are, are an interesting bunch. And I'm not the one to say that what, define what reality is and say we all have to conform to it, but I just want, I want to create the opportunity for people to be healthy and enjoy as much of their life as they want to. But definitely, I think we've seen that, you know, we've seen the consequences of low dopamine and we've seen the consequences of high. And so I think it's appropriate to talk about some of the solutions as we come to a close. So this is nutrition to increase dopamine. And that is nutrition to lower dopamine. Again, 80% of my practice, 20%. Now, I may not have an accurate cross-section of the United States. I don't know. But I know that people with high, high dopamine problems are suffering. Man, they suffer. Um, but so do people with low. Low dopamine, it's a little easier to fix. Usually they're meal skippers. They like to be hypoglycemic. They get used to having, they just, they just get used to running on an empty tank. I don't need breakfast. I'm in a hurry. I overslept, right? They're sleepy. They want to sleep more, so they sleep too late. Then they run off and get their day started three or four or five hours later. Their stomach is like making noise and everybody can hear it. And they go, oh, I guess I should, should eat something. Then they eat, they eat lunch and then they get sleepy because all that food that they just piled in was like the first calories they've had in 18 hours and so then they have to like pass out and you know the belly's too full so on and so forth so the way we do that is we the way we help these people is give them L-tyrosine, phenylalanine, these are the precursors to dopamine we give B12, methylfolate, really we, we use B complexes a lot but these two specifically especially the methylfolate is very important you have to have that in your B vitamin in order to make more dopamine Cordyceps is a, an adrenal adaptogen. Caffeine we talked about. Macuna, purines, that is actually called black velvet bean. That's another name for the plant. 
uh, it has dopamine in it. It literally has L-DOPA inside it. So it will raise dopamine very effectively. Eat high protein foods, frequent eating. I'm not here to say uh, everybody has to be an omnivore and eat, eat animals, but people who adapt certain lifestyles, um, philosophically or, or otherwise, you have to make sure that based on your body's needs, you're getting enough protein. And that's you know, just an, an individual uh, thing you have to figure out. But not enough protein means not enough neurotransmitters, not enough dopamine. 5-HTP skullcap. Skullcap's an interesting herb. It actually has melatonin and serotonin inside it. You know, this stuff is made in the plant kingdom, even made in single-cell bacteria. So skullcap herb's really good. L-theanine, taurine, niacinamide. Uh, this is green, decaffeinated green tea extract, melatonin, CBD oil, magnesium 3 and 8. There may even be a couple more on that list. So we have tools to lower dopamine, and they work. Um, we have people trying this pro these protocols every day, and it just it helps change people's lives. So if you or someone you know is dealing with an issue related to dopamine and imbalance, you know this is a this is a map to help them get better. Most important thing you do is figure out, and this is what we do for people clinically: are they actually low or high dopamine? One more study to just to give you an idea of, of what we focus on here is that I really like this study because it says that. Substantial evidence suggests that these two substances, dopamine and melatonin, are mutually inhibitory that act as chemical analogs of day and night. So that's kind of science speak. They're opposites of each other. You're supposed to have dopamine in your brain at nighttime. But when you watch an LED monitor, when you're under fluorescent lights, when you're on your phone, you're literally microwaving the melatonin and in suppressing its production. And we don't know what the consequences are of our, the modern world is full of like paradoxes. You know, we're clean, supposedly clean, but yet being clean makes you more sick, right? We're, we're wealthy, yet we're in more debt than our ancestors would ever conceptualize. We're not starving, but the quality of the food is the worst it's ever been. I mean, it's, it's just interesting paradoxes. And same thing with this, all this light is just roasting our melatonin. So we use a lot of melatonin in our practice. My mentor um, in Texas, Dr. Robert Rakowski, he uses, uh, he uses melatonin in his practice and sometimes, you know, doses uh, higher than you would think. But um, the research, there's, there's no evidence that we've seen clinically that there's like an upper limit of toxicity, especially, you know, you'd have to drink a gallon of this stuff to, to harm yourself. Does that mean everybody who takes melatonin is going to have a great, perfect experience with it? Probably not. But for the vast majority of people, it's safe, it's effective, it's inexpensive, it's a really good win. And so here's the picture of, of um, the wavelength issue. And so um, in hit melatonin inhibition, as you get into this blue wavelength, it just absolutely suppresses melatonin. Maybe, maybe the world would change if we just decided to replace fluorescent lights. That might be enough to change the world and save our healthcare, you know, a trillion dollars. I don't know. It'd be an interesting study. But we just come up with an idea and then we repeat it without understanding what the consequences are. So I appreciate you all listening. And I've, that's the dopamine dilemma. The question is, do you have high or do you have low? And what do you do to fix it? So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking and maybe give you guys a chance to ask a question or two and see if I can help clarify some things. Um. Or it's a couple things you said when you were saying testosterone causes dopamine to leave the body quicker. Mm -hmm. The difference with that. So if you take if you take testosterone supplement, supplementation, does that affect your? You know, guys. My husband would take um, you know supplement testosterone. Mm -hmm. So does that affect your dopamine? It it would. It, the testosterone makes the. It makes your liver speed up the removal of dopamine and adrenaline. Estrogen makes your liver slow it down. So guys, in my opinion, again, no, no, not intended to offend anyone, guys tend to seek out stressful, dumb, dangerous things to do because it actually calms them down, so ironically. When you get older, your, your testosterone actually <laughs> goes down. And your estrogen goes up as you get older, and guys too. Guys get fatter. You know, they get bigger, more body fat. Body fat makes turns their testosterone into estrogen, so they stop acting as. So it helps their dopamine levels. 
It does. It's a, estrogen's a natural antidepressant. But if, you are, if you're chocked full to the eyeballs with estrogen coming out of your pores, it's no longer an antidepressant. It becomes a pro-anxiety compound, right? Because it doesn't just stop. It doesn't just bring you from low to high or from low to the middle and stop. If the estrogen keeps going, it actually keeps pushing you too far to the other side. Well, you deal with estrogen because an estrogen being high creates other problems. It creates a risk of cancer in the ovaries, the prostate, testes, uterus, breast. And so detoxifying estrogen plays a much broader, it has a much bigger effect on the quality of their years and the dopamine will self-regulate. But if we, um, if we just treated the dopamine and didn't get after the estrogen, it's a great question because it kind of brings up the concept of how do you sequence these ideas. So this idea makes sense and so does this one. They're equal. Well, you can't do 10 things at once. You have to line it up the right way and go one, two, three, four, five, right? And that's how you see results. You build the foundation of your house first, then you frame it in, then you dry it in, then you put the roof on. You don't remodel the bathroom and go, man, I love doing bathrooms. I'm going to put marble down. It's going to be slick. Well, there's still no roof on the house. You know, you got to wait. You got to and in, in health, I mean, we understand that logically with construction, but in health, it's the same principle. So in our practice, you know, gut is first, then detoxification, then, you know, if there's anything left, then we would look at brain sort of by itself. Good question. Any other questions or comments on tonight? Well, about dopamine in relationship to Parkinson's. Because you said that, I mean, that's another. So it's where the cells aren't producing as much dopamine. And so with the, um, to kind of do the supplements that are. Yeah, these are, those right. Those would be good for. This is where we spend time with Parkinson's patients. We are working in this pathway. St. John's wort maybe should be on this list. It's great at raising dopamine. Um, one of the best herbs in the world for, for your neurology if you need more neurotransmitters. So yeah, this wasn't really, you know, we didn't touch on Parkinson's directly, but it, it certainly comes to mind in this case. And obviously people with Parkinson's are low dopamine. And if they take too many uh, milligrams of carbidopa, they overdose on it, they say, don't, you know, be careful, you could have hallucinations. You could have the side effects of the Parkinson's medication match the side effects of having too much dopamine. It's hard to figure out how to balance someone's dopamine when they have Parkinson's. They got to clean their gut up. They've got to get good detoxification, get the mold out, get the metal. There's all these natural medicine concepts that each time you do one, the person gets a healthier foundation, and then there's, then the brain is easier to balance. Um, but it's a good question. So that's really where this model comes into hand, comes in handy with Parkinson's is what we look at the low dopamine people. We consider them a low dopamine person and we work on increasing their dopamine. And we have several patients with Parkinson's and they've seen good results. We've seen good results in that, in that patient population using these ideas. Other questions or comments? I'm wondering if people who are on like the higher end of dopamine that may be present with more anxiety and panic, they maybe get themselves to the point where they have adrenal fatigue. Oh, sure. And then they are mimicking the same symptoms. Low dopamine with the excessive sleepiness and fatigue. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, if somebody is stuck on the right side of the curve, with high levels of uh, anxiety and panic, and they are in this high catecholamine state long enough, it just simply because of the lack of sleep, the lack of recovery, because of the negative effect it has on the adrenals, eventually your cortisol levels will exhaust themselves. And you, you could deplete, yes. An individual could become depleted in dopamine from spending too much time over here. So that's a more nuanced case. Um, and we, people like that can rebuild as well. We, what you'd have to do is just, the therapeutic trial would be, if we recommended tyrosine and B vitamins, did they experience more anxiety? Right? Do we need to give them B5 and B6 to help the adrenals, but not B9 and B12? Because B9 and B12 help them uh, stimulate their brain too much. And these are the, this is the nature of practice. But that's a really, a really good question, and honestly, probably something we see a lot in patients who've had this issue for a long time. Adrenal fatigue, adrenal burnout is really common 
in this group of people because they're on the roller coaster and they just, they're on the ride and they can't get off for a while. You know, they can't calm down. So we go back in time and give them melatonin every waking hour, one milligram every waking hour for seven to 10 days with some other nutrients like CBD oil or L-theanine every waking hour. You know, you'd break the cycle. So there's always, there's, the, the tools that are available now are, are amazing to, to work on this stuff. Carly, in the back. Um, I was going to ask, what if you have symptoms of both low dopamine and high dopamine? I love that question, yes. So, it's not really a fine thing. Well, you consider the hormone component. Women tend to have higher catecholamines. Men tend to have low, not always across the board. I'd look at how long somebody sleeps. I'd look at other patterns. Um, but really what's happening is, is this model, right? So if, you, if somebody spends a lot of time with high levels of dopamine, dopamine changes, dopamine changes minute by minute. Literally, the half-life of dopamine in your brain as it's released is like two seconds and it's pulled back. That's how fast the body kicks it out and brings it back in. But the receptor that sits on the outside of your cell, the yellow line, that takes a couple weeks to adapt. So if you've been adapting to, say somebody's had high dopamine for a long time, just a real stressful like three months. Well, the dopamine level's been high and the receptor level gets cropped. Because if this receptor level was really high along with the dopamine level, you'd be feeling manic and psychotic symptoms out here. So your brain goes, oh God, that's way too much dopamine, you know? So mow the grass, cut the, cut the receptors off down much lower. And so now you have low receptors. And if you go through a period of time after that, say at the end of that three months where you just didn't, you, you, your digestion got off and you didn't eat the right food and all of a sudden you didn't make enough dopamine, now you have a situation where you have low dopamine and low receptors. You'll feel depressed. You'll, feel, you'll have those symptoms really bad. Does that model make sense? Your body adapts. It goes, okay, we're going to be here now. Oh, oh no. Now the dopamine level just fell off in the... The, uh, the blue line changes by the second, the yellow line changes by the week. So it takes a while for your body to catch up. So the goal is, like I said earlier, you don't want to be on a roller coaster. You want to meet your, I, I don't need to have error prediction in my life. I don't need a giant amount of dopamine every day. I don't need to expect to have $20 in my wallet and find 60, you know. I just want to, if I expect 20 to have 20, I'll, I'll settle for that. I'll settle for expectations being met. If they're exceeded, great, thank, thank goodness, but I, I really want to go for expectations being met. And if that model verbally gets applied to this, what that means is you, you help your brain dip, start to understand in your world how much dopamine you're making and keep it as stable as you can and your body will adjust. Does that answer the question? One, one molecule moves by the second, the other moves by the week, and you have to get them to balance. You got these nutrients, right, that you're suggesting? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm probably confused because you gave a lot of, you could be like, oh, I'm, ex I'm experiencing either high or low, and you take different nutrients. Right, you might guess wrong. Yeah. And it's not a drug and it doesn't ruin your life, but it might make you feel uncomfortable for a couple of days and go, oh, geez, that wasn't the right thing for me. I should try the opposite set, the opposite kind. I took melatonin and man, I was sleeping like, five hours a day, didn't work. Well, then you already had low dopamine. You didn't need to lower it more with melatonin. Maybe just take it at night, help you sleep a little deeper. But that's the, you know, it's, they call it an art, they call it a, a practice. I, I wish it was always cut and dry, but you have to tune into people and everybody's different. And Can I just ask one more question? Of course. So the addiction, like I'm thinking screen addiction, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because I fret, you know, the it raises your dopamine, right? If mm -hmm. you're on this, you get this, this quick stimulation. So that's producing too much dopamine. But I guess what I'm wondering is, over time, can it just be you? You'll adapt there's to There's nothing it. permanent, right? You cannot. Okay, my dopamine is just lower because I've been doing this behavior for so, like any kind of addiction, I guess, for so long that. Do you think that the person when they play? Minecraft for the first time, they have a certain level of dopamine. Do you think when they play Minecraft for the hundredth time that it's the same amount of dopamine? No. I don't think so. How about skiing a black diamond? The first time you 
you nail a black diamond, you have a certain amount of dopamine. How about the, how about the hundredth time? Probably not. Yeah. Expected error, your expectations, what you have accustomed so you yourself lower, to. You lowered your dopamine? It's no longer an expectation that you have. The expectation was you were uncertain of the black diamond. It was exciting, it was new, and it, it was novel, the novelty. And now it's no longer, you take it for granted. So now you need to go off of cliffs to get the same amount of dopamine that you got going down a black diamond. I mean, I'm just, that's the progression, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, this one addition can lead to another addition. Amen. Because you can't, unless you raise your dopamine levels, right? Bingo. Get a gold then star. you're talking about over here where you have high, kind of whatever it's called, right. high dopamine levels, but that's caused by not maybe the addiction. I guess that's where I'm getting confused, because if you've got an addiction. The addiction is self-medication to uh, fix a low dopamine problem. But if you have high, like, okay, so my one son, you're talking about the aches, and, I mean, you touch him, and, like, you're saying the symptoms of, like, him having high dopamine, but yet, um, so, can you get the high dopamine from that addictive behavior? Can you overdo it? Yeah, you can overdo it. You can go too far. You could, you could, you could do an addictive thing and have, I see what you're saying. So, no, there's no law that says if you do something dangerous and stressful that it only moves you here for a little while. It could, you could go way on that end, you see? But you'd have to listen to the person. They'll tell you what's going on. But just in principle, in theory, and in practice, people who have addictions are trying to self-move themselves over here. But what if they go, whoa, man, I went too far. Woo, I went down the other side. Now, I'm, now, I'm, now I have too much dopamine. Dang it. It just sets them on a roller coaster. So they're going to be chasing the, it's just a mess. So what do I like to have people do? This is, this is my advice. You need to eat frequently. If you're trying to balance your brain and you have adrenal fatigue and other issues and gut problems, I'm not saying that fasting has no value. I'm not talking about treating cancer patients with ketosis. That's another discussion. This is brain chemistry. You're asking, how do you balance dopamine? You eat every couple hours. Every two to three hours, put in 100 calories of food. It will level your blood sugar out and that steady delivery of dopamine to your brain. Avoid staying up late, staring at screens. Avoid, um, you know, stimulants and other things that would, avoid anything that would make this go up quick because it could drop back down fast. We just want to create stability. That's why fixing gut problems and improving digestion and changing diets ultimately changes the brain because there's this whole, like, pipeline of, of dopamine being fed into the brain. Oh, the dopamine, now the brain knows the dopamine's coming. It doesn't have to go do something risky or, or um, you know, unhealthy to get it because the dopamine shows up before the urge or the craving does. But if they're doing screen time, it's consistent. Does that mean that you're saying, like, well, I'm going to go back to the black diamond, that if they get the dopamine fixed on the first time but not the second or third, then does that, doesn't that just sort of take away the addiction? It doesn't take away the addiction if, think about it like this. So here's a, here's a picture. Um, Sally's going down a black diamond for the first time. Woo, that was rad, you know? And now a week later, uh, that was fun. I'm gonna do a black diamond today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ski black diamonds. It just becomes not an addiction. Well, it just, it, no, it just re it reduces the amount of dopamine that she releases. But if she's not addicted to the dopamine, she doesn't really need to go do it. What if Sally's here? She doesn't need to go raise it anymore. She won't even be attracted to doing black diamonds because it makes her feel anxious and raises her blood pressure and makes her, it's not fun anymore. And it's not about ability. She could probably do it better than all the guys could. The point is that if she already has enough dopamine, why would she want to go and raise it even more? She could just be doing it because it's fun. But I'm, I'm, people do, maybe she's getting some dopamine from it, and yes, she could do it because it's fun, but the people who are literally addicted to it, who put their lives at risk, I'm just using this as an example, the, the life-risking extreme behavior is a desire to raise dopamine. So if you have a more yeah. normal balance, then you, you're just doing it because it's fun. It's right, not addiction. right. Because remember, if she's, if she's doing it because it's fun, it means that she doesn't have... She's not doing it for this blast of dopamine. She's just doing it because it feels good and it's exciting to be in the mountains and there's all these other factors that she likes. She's not doing it because it has to be faster, more dangerous, and I did it, you know. We just know people, we've all known people, and maybe we've done it ourselves, who went too far. 
you know, people destroy, like they avoid growing up, they live out of their cars and, you know, climb all over the world. And, that, and that's a good life for them. But it's just climbing is a way to get dopamine. Tying a rope to yourself and going 3,000 feet up the rock, you're looking for dopamine. It's a cool lifestyle. It's an awesome experience, but you're looking for dopamine. Ski bums, wingsuit people, drug addicts, uh, people get in bar fights. I mean, I don't know. They're all looking for dopamine somewhere, honestly. It's an interesting conversation, isn't it? What, did you learn something tonight? Mm -hmm. What did you say about the uh, too much adrenaline in your gut? Well, Bacteria, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, every time you get stressed out, half of your adrenaline goes into your gut. Literally, like, the quantity goes, half the quantity goes in your bloodstream, the other half quantity goes into your gut. So people have been through adrenal fatigue and chronic stress, develop all kinds of weird gut problems, even though they were never, they didn't go and like drink water in you know, some jungle somewhere. They just were stressed out for too long and their gut bacteria grew and grew and grew and they created a gut problem. But it's fixable. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you've, made it, you've made it through the video. Hopefully there's some, some information here that you can relate to your own life, to your friends, family. Um, I'm just basically sharing with you everything we use in our practice. I don't believe that healthcare should be something that you always have to pay a ton of money to get the information you need. I'd like to get all the information we can out there for free. And that's part of what this YouTube project is all about. So if you like this video, if you like our channel and the information we have, get yourself a copy of this book. But even more than that, if you're somebody out there who's looking for help for yourself, for a loved one, for a friend or family member, you reach out to us. We have a clinic that serves people from over 20 different countries. And we have people, people traveling from Europe, traveling from all over the United States to see us in person. And we also do work over the internet uh, through a telemedicine practice. So uh, Red Mountain Natural Medicine is the name of our office here in Boise. And if you like what's on this video and you need some help yourself, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'll figure out a way to help you get the help you need. Thanks so much and have, a, have an excellent day.